I pray that you'll give to them and make them winners of others. On their work, wherever they may be, in the street corners, filling stations, or wherever it might be, to testify in the grocery store to the milkman, whatever it might be, Lord, if something warms up on their heart, may they be a witness. May they live such godly and sanctified lives until they'll be written epistles read of all men. My name is Craig Boer, and I was born in 1974, and uh, uh, one of seven children, and I uh, was born in Ohio, and done a lot of traveling in my life, uh, but always come back to Ohio, lived in Mississippi and, and uh, Tennessee and out west, but always come back to Ohio, so Ohio is what I call home, and um, a very early experience that I had. At the age of five, uh, we had moved as a family to Tennessee, and uh, I believe the, the town was called Ottawa. And uh, we lived in a uh, in an apartment housing. Dad had uh, rented a little apartment, and uh, there was a bunch of us little kids. And it was uh, primarily a black community, and uh, you know we were from the north, and we were never raised with prejudice and things like that. I mean it. Those things meant nothing to us, but the area was was uh, struggled in in those things, and uh, we just befriended uh, the black people and played and you know just uninhibited. Uh, but some of the people didn't like that. Um, the we had a a school that was divided it divided the apartments there was a woods between the apartments and the school and i was going to kindergarten there at that little school there and we would walk through the woods to go to to school um it was on a saturday uh my brother my oldest brother freddie my younger brother jeremy and myself and a little boy he was a a little uh, black boy he was our friend his name was darren we all went to on a Saturday to the playground to play at the school. And uh, that day, there was a man that, uh, an adult, that come around the school and he had uh, curly hair. Um, and he approached us at the playground. And I was on the slide and I remember, I remember trying to get his attention, showing off as a you know, five-year-old would do, and trying to show off and get his attention. And I was sliding and I think I might have started talking to him. And somehow we made a formation of a line, and he, I was standing in the front of the line, and he said, what's your name? And uh, we were children, he was an adult. And he said, my name is Craig, and he shook my hand. And he looked at my brother, Freddie, my older brother. He said, what's your name? He said, my name is Freddie. You know, we're, we're proud, a big person's talking to us. And he looked at my little brother, Jeremy, he said, what's your name? He said, I'm Jeremy, and he shook his hand. And he come to Darren, um, our little our little friend there, and uh, he took his hand. He said, what's your name? He said, I'm Darren. And he, and he started to uh, squeeze his hand till Darren fell on his knees and was crying. And he was he was just squeezing his hand with a full grip of a man, squeezing a child's hand. And when he did that, he said, um, I hate. And he used a term that was uh, inappropriate for black people. And... Um, He's squeezing this child's hands, and we were frozen. We didn't know what to do. And he told us he would kill us if we moved. And so we just stood still, and he began to walk away from us. And he would occasionally turn his head and look at us. And he went distant and got further away. And I remember him going behind the school, looking at us one last time and going behind the school. Well, my oldest brother, Fred, said, run. And we run home, told our parents, and they called the police. And, of course, they couldn't find him. That was on a Saturday, and then on the following Monday that came, um, it was an overcast, windy day, and my brother and sister, my older brother and sister, were walking in front of me, and we had walked through that trail in the woods to get to the school, and I I just knew that this man was behind every tree, he was going to jump out, and he was going to get me, and I was squalling with everything I had. I mean, I was just terrified, and I was screaming, Freddy! Michelle, and they couldn't hear me because the wind was blowing. And uh, I was walking up the hill, just squalling. 
And I heard a voice as clear as my voice. And it said, don't fear. And it was, it was a, it was a man's voice. And I, I stopped and I looked around and nobody was around. Nobody was around me. And I looked up and the clouds separated and a, and a light come through the clouds. And as a little child, I knew God spoke to me and told me those words, don't fear. And this part is a little foggy, but I'm almost positive that I wiped the tears off my face and I walked up that hill to the school without crying because I, I believed that voice that told me don't fear. And after school uh, let out, I took off running home. Mom, Mom, God, talk to me. I mean, just... But what that did was at the age of five, um, it, it uh, impressed my heart. It did something to my heart that I knew God was real. It left an impression on my heart that I knew God was real. And I carried that with me all my life. Um, I didn't become a Christian until the age of 23, but I carried that with me all my life. And I believe God was letting me know, one, that he was guiding my footsteps. And number two, uh, even when I get in, even today, when I get in tough situations, uh, and I just I just feel like I don't know what to do, those words will return to my heart, don't fear, and I feel God is with me. And so I think God was encouraging me and showing me he had a plan for my life. Um, as I grew older, we grew up in a, you know, a, a God-fearing home. Our parents taught us to fear God, but we, we weren't living the message by any means. I mean, we, uh, done a lot of things that the world done. But mom and dad sowed a, a fear God in our hearts, which kept me from a lot of things, uh, damaging my life in different areas. And as, as a young boy, we got into martial arts. Loved it spent all of our time, invested all of our time in the martial arts, and we started fighting in competitions. Uh, loved it. Won a lot of trophies. Won a lot of competitions. All of us boys did it. Dad was just proud of his little little brood. And then, um, then uh, at the age of 17, we got into boxing. And at that point, that was that was full contact. I thought, I have arrived. This is... This is it. This is what it's about. And I, and I started to gravitate away from martial arts into boxing because it was full contact. And I loved it. And what it did is it sowed a discipline in my life. It sowed a discipline in my life that kept me away from drugs and alcohol and different things like that. Um, and so I thank the Lord. And it also taught me to, to fight when things get tough. You just persevere. I believe God instilled a lot of characteristics and qualities in me through those fighting days. That, uh, that even I use uh, today to, to fight for truth, the great battle of truth that we fight for. 1992, I was at the age of 17, uh, my world seemed to be shattered. Uh, we were poor, we didn't have much, we had each other, and we loved each other. But in 1992, Mom and Dad, their relationship was severed under real ugly circumstances. And everything that I held to be true and dear seemed to just unravel and come apart. Which threw me into a wandering phase of my life. I didn't know what I believed. I didn't know where to turn. And I was looking for adventure. I was looking to fulfill this great void in my soul. And um, everything I believed in was gone, it seemed like. And I staggered through that through about five years. And at the age of 23, I was watching Little House in the Prairie. And a glorious turn of events took place. Um, I was watching uh, Little House in the Prairie, which was a prairie life, old-time pioneer days, which I admired deeply. And Michael Landon, who played the character of uh, Charles Ingalls, was reading his Bible. And I was watching it. Something started burning in my heart. My mom came into the room. I looked at mom. I said, mom, I'm going to read the whole Bible. And, and I believe it was God that inspired her. She said, honey, start with the New Testament. And I picked up an old Bible that we had around the house and it was old leather covered Bible. And I opened it up and I did just what she told me, instructed me to do. I started with Matthew and a fire started in my soul. I couldn't put it down. Something supernatural started right there. And my brother Freddie, he saw me praying and reading. 
And so he took the same Bible and he opened it up and a fire lit in his heart. And we became companions. There were message books and tapes that were sitting on the shelves for years. We pulled them off the shelves, found the address, started ordering tapes from Jeffersonville. And I remember the first sermon I heard, Lean Not to Thine Own Understanding. I heard the discernment, and I about come through the roof of my truck. I mean, I just, God, it was like, like I had been blind, groping in darkness. And I lived in this world all my life. It was like God opened my eyes, and for the first time I could appreciate the trees, and the sun, and the leaves, and the blue skies, and the grass. And it was like this world I lived in all my life now had living color. And uh, so I thought everyone should see it. And I went to work. And I, I testified to anything that moved. I worked on an assembly line. And uh, the people that worked across from me, they had to work there two hours and then they would rotate. So I had a captive audience. And everything that I knew, I just preached to them and talked to them about the Lord. And then then I would get a new one, every a new audience every two hours. And so that's that's where my walk with God began. When I went to work, um, things started uh, changing very, very rapidly. And um, I went to work and was just testifying to anything, anyone that would listen. And there was a man by the name of Dave Llewellyn. Uh, we be, we became friends, very close friends, quickly. And uh, he he was the first one that come into the message. He's anchored today. He's a rock, just a solid man of God. And. Uh, then I met another man by the name of Eric Roberts. He was just had a powerful mind, just a great guy. And he loved to debate. He loved to debate, and but he did it in good spirit. I mean, you'd walk out of there with your head spinning, but his arm would be around you, and he'd be punching you. He great guy, Catholic, and uh, we had so much Bible discussion that he he one day said, "Brother Craig, why, why don't we come to my my house and um, have a Bible study?" And I said, uh, very well. So we, we went to the house, and he would step out during the Bible study to smoke cigarettes, him and his wife. And I don't know how, but after about three uh, Bible studies, somehow, I guess I just had a lot to say, I ended up leading them. And through that, by the grace of God, um, Eric Roberts, he come out of Catholicism. God delivered him of his cigarettes, and he become a Christian, was baptized in Jesus Christ's name. His wife delivered of cigarettes, was baptized in Jesus Christ's name. Her best friend uh, come out of the world and was baptized in Jesus Christ's name. Her sister-in-law come out of the world was baptized in Jesus Christ's name. And it started as a trickle. And by this time, I'd found I uh, the church that I now pastor, Bible Believers. I went there a few times when I was young. Uh, I'd went there and I met Isaiah Brooks, who was pastor in the church at the time, and we developed an instant friendship. And he, I was bringing these people to him to baptize them, and he, and then he'd baptize them, and I'd bring him another one. He'd baptize them, and I'd bring him another one. And um, so he was watching me and studying me. He said, "Son, there's a gift in your life." I was even afraid to entertain such a thought. I was just like, "I'm just witnessing," you know. And so he told me, he said, uh, "Son, you start a." service in your house because I've seen this before we lived an hour north of the church so we were plenty of ways away and he goes I've seen this before I want you to get a service in your house Dave Llewellyn the first one that uh, we brought to the Lord he he built a pulpit and uh, we started having house services and people started coming to the Lord uh, the one that came to the Lord at that time was uh, Simon Smith Simon Smith uh I knew him at Sauter's. He has a phenomenal ability to witness, loves to witness. He's not a minister, per se, but his his world, the world is this pulpit. He has the ability to witness to anybody, any place, anytime, anywhere, and they listen to him. And he went out, once he was convinced that this message was true, he went out and started pulling in souls for the kingdom. Oh, my. His, his first one that he brought in was his brother Jesse, Jesse Smith. Jesse latched on to the Word of God and uh, come out of organization, went out to Akron and started witnessing, and they uh, rose up a church. He's a pastor today. Uh, another one in those meetings was a man by the name of uh, Tim Meyer. 
Tim Meyer come in. I think he was a Methodist. And uh, he come into the old house meetings and just turned immediately. And uh, went out and started preaching. He's an evangelist today out on the East Coast. And then uh, Cam Smith, which was uh, Simon's other brother, he he hated us. He wanted to clean my clock. He didn't like the message. He didn't like nothing to do with any of it. And uh, he fought it for a year. And after a year, he just threw up his hands and said, I'm going to go see what those folks are up to in that house. And so he comes staggering into the house. And God, I mean, immediately, God just converted him. Like Paul, he that once persecuted the church became a preacher. And today he's pastoring a church and a work, a work that started right there in that area that I'm speaking of. He's pastoring a church today. And uh, we had had a lot of opposition and uh, against the meetings because it, it was a revival of young people. It was it was very peculiar that it was young people coming out of organization into Christ. They were uh, leaving their systems of religion and finding the Lord as their Savior. And so the ministers weren't happy, and we were we were kind of a persecuted little group there. Uh, in a house uh, that sat on uh, church and vine. And they came to our house to expose us. And we had a showdown on the porch. and Oh, it was, it was a lot of adventure for young kids that come out of Babylon to serve God. And so this went on. It, it exploded uh, on church and vine. And there was a total of about uh, 40 souls that come to the Lord uh, through that, that space, that three years. And then all of a sudden, the revival... It seemed to come to an abrupt stop. One soul in the whole year. It just come to a total stop. And I thought, well, what am I doing wrong? Or I prayed and I fasted. And I thought, what, what did I do right? How? Why ain't it working anymore? And it took me years to, to see that God was working a work of salvation in that area. It was sovereign. God used who he wanted to. He chose who he wanted to. And he just came down in a sovereign way and worked salvation in that area. And when he sanged it dry, he moved on. And he used us for other areas of a work in the body. From that point, I went into evangelism, off of the street work into evangelism, and then I become a pastor. And so God just used us in different ways. And, and God is to receive all glory. I mean, not, none of that had nothing to do with me. I was just watching it happen. And then I didn't win all those souls, you know. We'd win a soul here, and they'd go out and pull them in. And, it was it was marvelous in our eyes. Um, one thing that I want to maybe move back to very early in my uh, experience with God that that really uh, showed me that God was doing something specific in this generation, something um, very specific to our age, was I. It was I. I think prior. Um, it was prior to the revival. It was just the early, early parts of my conversion. I got my hand on a church age book. And it was during, it was uh, 1997, March 24th, 1997. It was Palm Sunday. It was during the time of uh, the comet Hell, Hellbop. They, it was made big news at that time. We were watching it that evening, uh, the comet in the sky. You could see it in the sky. I got my hands on a church age book. We were traveling that day, my father, uh, me, Freddie, uh, a, a man by the name of Larry Manns, and my brother Daniel, and we got home very late. It was it was just getting right up around 12 midnight. I think we were transitioning from the 23rd of March to the 24th, and we all sat down in the living room. I took my church age book and I just opened it, just randomly opened it. I looked down and in bold letters it said, "Christ has left the church." And what he was speaking of of that time is Brother Brandon was taking the scripture, I stand at the door and knock. And he was showing that Jesus was not knocking at a heart, but was knocking on the door of his own church, that his own church had put him outside, and this was the condition of this age. And from that point, he went into the sun representing God, the moon representing the church, and that when the world gets between the sun and the moon, that it creates a darkness upon the moon. Well, the moon representing the church was to reflect the light of the sun. But when the world gets in the way, it can't do its job. So it becomes darkened. Brother Branham was using this type in this, in this portion of the church ages to show that this church age had become 
apostate, that it had put Christ outside the church, and the church had no life to give. And so he said Christ was left the church. I read that portion, and I showed everyone in the room. There was a picture of six eclipses in the church age book. I showed everyone in the room. Closed the book, and I said, I've got to go. It's about 12 midnight. i got to go. I walked out uh, of of um, the house, and I had an old Ford F-150, an ugly baby blue, rusted, three on the tree, uh, straight six. I was scraping the windows and had it running. My dad and my brother Daniel come walking out of the door, and they looked up, and they said, Craig, and I'm scraping my windows. When I look, they are looking up into the sky, and when I look up, the moon was eclipsed exactly like the picture of blood red, exactly like the picture. And immediately I knew that God, what I had read was more than just words, that it was a reality. Why God would show me such a sign, I don't know. But I have to say, I was convinced right now, uh, right then, that God was doing a marvelous work and that the message was right. I think it was in 1999. Um, I was still young, heart, thirsty heart. Brother Isaiah Brooks was my pastor. We were at Bible Believers Church. Brother Brooks was preaching. I don't remember the title. Uh, of what he was preaching, but I do remember the theme. And his theme was that Jesus Christ never, never preached a funeral. And that he, any funeral he ever came to, he just, he broke it up. And he used various examples, like the widow, uh, of Nain. I believe her son had died, and when Jesus had come, uh, a resurrection come forth, and he brought the dead back to life again. He used the example of Lazarus. How he came to the tomb of Lazarus and a man had been dead four days. He called death back to life again. He used the example, I believe it was Tabitha, the young girl that uh, that had died. And Jesus said, she's not dead but sleepeth. And they laughed at him. He put him out of the room. And he says, daughter, arise. And she was dead and she raised again back to life. He was using those various examples of the Bible to, to show and to prove that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And everywhere he went, he interrupted funeral processions. It was highly a highly anointed service. And out of nowhere, Brother Isaiah, Brother Brooks, he just stopped and said, I feel led to stop. And he dismissed service. And so everyone kind of meandered out of the church slowly, fellowshipping and talking out into the parking lot. It was a beautiful day. I, I was young and thirsty. So he had a parsonage connected to the property. I run right over to his house, took off my shoes, opened my Bible, and I'm just studying the Word. Everyone else still in the church parking lot. Sister Ruby, Brother Brooks, I, Brother Isaiah's wife, come out and said, Brother Craig, will you go tell Brother Brooks it's time to eat? I said, yes, ma'am. So I put my Bible down, put my shoe on. I got my other shoe on, and just as I laced it, I heard a squall scream of a car and a bang. And then shortly after, a woman starts screaming. And I run out the door, and I look out, and what had happened was a, a car was at a stop sign at an intersection, and a truck, a car pulled out in front of a truck, and it T-boned it and threw it over into a yard. I yelled into the house, there's been an accident, call 911. And it was quite a distance from me. The woman is continually screaming. And I take off running, off the porch, cross the parsonage, yard, over the church parking lot, across the churchyard, over the road, into a yard where the car had spun off. As I'm approaching the car, the back of the car is facing me, and there are two children in the back of the car. Both of them in car seats, both of them were fine. The passenger side is open, and a brother has arrived before me. The woman is continually screaming. The driver was a doctor from Pakistan. I believe Raza was his name. He was laying over into the passenger side. His wife is on top of him, holding his head there in Muslim garb. She's holding his head screaming, just screaming loudly. As I arrive, there's a brother that got there before me. On the passenger side of the car, the door is open. He's on his knees. His hand is on his chest, and he's praying. Uh, another man had just laid his hands on top of the brother that's praying. As I arrive, I look in, and 
his head is laid back like this. His eyes are set. Blood is running from his nose and his mouth. And she's holding his head. And he's just sitting there like this. I look at him. And I remember my thought passed through my head. He's dead. I lay my hands on him. And I begin to pray. Strangely, there was about three adults at the scene. There was a man going around in the car. And he was cursing. Because he knew he killed the man. Um, strangely, young people. Uh, a host of young people. Come pouring out of the church. And they... As they, they made a pile, everyone just began to dog pile, began to pray and was calling on the Lord. And it seemed, it seemed forever. Uh, and all of a sudden, the grace of Almighty God come on the scene. And life come back into the man. And I remember when he come to, he goes, hey, 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 like this. And it's moving so fast, we're not realizing what's happening. So we, we back off. We all moved back. They'd called the jaws of life. Took forever for them to get there. They had to cut him out of the car. We all move rooms so the rescue people can get in. We had, we'd got there before the rescue people. And they shipped into the hospital. And the physical problems that this man had was amazing. I, I wish, uh, I've got the newspaper at home. I, I don't recall everything that was wrong. Internal and external. Uh, it, it was a host of them. And he, they, he should have died. I mean, to the medical world, he was a paradox. He was a miracle to the medical world. Um, one of the things that was astounding to me was there, the Bible says, let every word be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. His wife was a nurse, as I'm told. And she had checked his pulse, and he was gone. She was holding his neck because she thought it was broke. That's why she was holding his neck and she was screaming. The first brother that got there, his name was Brother Taylor. His hand was on his chest. His head was, his heart wasn't beating. Uh, but when life came back into him, he said he felt his heart go like this. No CPR, no mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Another brother on the other side of the car, his name was Jeremy Flory. He could never tell the story without crying. He was on the other side of the car. He said, Brother Craig, he said, when he raised, he said, I felt life. I felt God put life back in his body. And when I looked at him, I could tell he was gone. But this is, this is the greatest thing to me. Reflecting upon the sermon Brother Brooks was preaching, that Jesus never preached a funeral. Highly anointed service. And he's giving the examples of the widow at name. He's giving the examples of Lazarus. He's giving the examples of Tabitha. I believe it. I think it was Tabitha. The little girl that was raised. Whatever her name was there. And he said, Jesus Christ never preached a funeral. To me, I don't believe that was a coincidence. That he's in this channel and he stops perfectly. Then Jesus shows us to prove to us that he in fact is the same yesterday, today and forever. And to prove to us that He is the, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that He is the resurrection and the life today. He brings us out to a car accident. There's three witnesses that He's gone. God, after prayer, puts life back in the man to prove that He is the living God and that He is the same today. And He still is a God that don't preach funerals, that preaches resurrection. <laughs> a wonderful thing that instilled faith in my heart at a very young age in the Lord. And I'm happy to testify that he's the same today. It was early on, uh, a couple years into my taking the church as pastor. I'm, I'm six years pastor now. It was just a couple years and the word was really, really coming alive to me in a different, in a different dimension, in a different depth. As I gave myself fully to the word of God, um, it's wonderful. And I, I got on a, a, actually, I was inspired from a message that Brother Branham preached called The Key in the Door. And it's a very, very simple principle. Brother Branham simply taught that the key is the scripture, that Christ is the door, that the key is held in a hand of faith. And the right key in the door unlocks the glory of God to the people. The wrong key will not gain you access. And a simple illustration of that is baptism in Jesus Christ's name. That the Bible gave us a promise. Simply, the immutable word of God says, 
repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that promise is to as many as the Lord our God shall call. Satan knew that this was the key. So he takes away the key of baptism in Jesus Christ's name and he replaces it with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which locks the door. No matter how sincere, no matter what kind of efforts you may make, the wrong key will not give, gain you entrance. So that was my theme. That was, uh, and I went into many different areas, altar calls. I went into uh, tearing meetings and different things of that nature. And uh, I was inspired. God sovereignly came down, inspired the service. There was a man in the service. He's my song leader and also a trustee, godly man, a wonderful believer by the name of Joe C. He had some sort of affliction that the doctors were even uh, baffled about. They weren't certain what was wrong with him, but his limbs were swelling. Uh, he had not wore his wedding ring in six months. Uh, they had even talked about giving him chemo treatments. Uh, they didn't know what was wrong. And in this service, the Spirit of God was climbing and faith was climbing. And out of nowhere, he become awakened to Christ as his healer. And sitting right where he was, he accepted Christ as his healer. And I knew immediately that, that something had happened. He'd come after the service. He had run up to the front before the whole congregation. And he was crying. And he said, Craig, he said, God healed me right in my seat. And I knew it was real. And I told him, I said, you testify to the people because he's the high priest of our profession. Uh, we must confess it. And then the high priest intercedes upon what we profess. So he went up before the pulpit and he held his hands up. He was crying. He said, God healed me right in my seat. The people rejoiced. And we had a wonderful service. Well, that was on a Sunday. The following Wednesday, uh, he come into my office. I think he was leading songs. And he, and he sat down and this was astounding to me. He said, Brother Craig, I have never had a bulldog faith. Never in my life. He's just a transparent kind of guy. He said, I've never had it. He said, but in that service, he said, God gave me a bulldog faith. He said, he dropped it right in my heart. And he said, I accepted my healing. He said, Satan's been against me all week. He said, he can't move me. He said, I have got faith in Christ as my healer. He held up his hand. He said, I've not worn my wedding ring in six months. And he had his wedding ring on for the first time in six months. And uh, so it was marvelous to see once God reveals it, he took the key, he put it into the door, and he unlocked his healing. And truly healing, salvation, any blessing in the Bible is that accessible to anyone that will use the key and put it in the door. He just reached out and he took it. Every promise is that tangible. It will just approach God right. When you're walking down a path, um, you don't always see God before you. And you almost are looking around every corner to see, you know, to find God. And somehow you can almost feel disappointed when you don't find what you're looking for. But strangely, when you look back, you can see God in every step that you took. And reflecting upon um, the revival that took place and my testimony, as simple as it was, what I, what I find joy about was it wasn't what I knew. I came to the Lord. He became real to me. And I, I've described him as a, a man who's blind, who lived in this world, but never saw. But now the light comes on and he sees the trees and he sees the, he sees the grass and he hears the birds and he sees the sunshine. He lived in this world, but he never saw it. And now it becomes living color. And he becomes so full of joy because of the things in which he sees and is experiencing. And that's like salvation. Um, when God becomes real to you, it, he turns light in darkness. And it's, it's as real as, as you're sitting there or me sitting here. And it's, it's off of that strength that I went to my workplace and began to testify of God. It wasn't the material things that I knew. It wasn't the doctrines. It wasn't meriting a certain position in God or being placed in a... I fell in love with God. God became real. I felt everyone else should see what I see. And so I started talking to him about God. And the people, I believe, was convinced that I saw something. 
And I use the illustration of John Wesley, who said, if you set a man on fire, he said, people will come from all over the country just to watch him burn. And the, and the greatest drawing card that the world has ever seen is the gospel, is a man that has met God. And so what I love about it is, you know, this was a revival of young people. It wasn't what we knew. It wasn't some doctrine that we discovered and we finally found the key. We loved God. God became real. Salvation became real to us. And we were out testifying to the world of, of what God has done in this generation. So I want to encourage anyone that's out there that it ain't the material things that you know. It's knowing Him and the power of the resurrection. It's loving Him. Fall in love with the Lord and everything else just, everything else takes its place. I could honestly say, I just sat back and watched it and marveled as the things happen. And that's the way God works. Salvation is of the Lord. It's no man can glory. God uses men whom He will, when He will. He'll do what He wants to. All we can do is yield our vessels, sanctify ourselves for Him. Say, Lord, I'm happy to do whatever I can for you, anytime. And it ain't about me. It's all about the Lord. And that He's real. And that He is a living God. And He's real to our hearts.